Big respect. You know, it's different in uh, period number two because uh, go ahead. Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you, Mustafa. So big respect. Why is a big respect? Because uh, it's a last leg to take. So you can almost see the finishing line, almost. You know, there's a couple more lectures to go and, uh, you know, I can tell you that uh, what we are about to discuss in the second period is way more pleasant than multi-body system dynamics. It's like, uh, you know, discussing like, what is your name? You know, uh, how you like about the weather? How many chin-ups Aki can do? This kind of stuff. And uh, it's gonna be more like casual discussion rather than a heavy theoretical aspect, but not quite yet. I still wanna torture you another 45 minutes or so. Another torturing will be uh, one more session or one more set about multi-body system dynamics. And once I'm done with that, then I promise we're moving on to hydraulics. And hydraulic modeling is conceptually very different than modeling of multi-body system dynamics. Conceptually very different because, uh, you know, the math involving the hydraulics is very pleasant. So it's not very difficult at all. Actually, we don't need that many equations at all. So it's a few equations only. So only so few that you can almost memorize them. And another big thing is that, uh, you know, most of the cases we'll be looking at, the, make, or the hydraulic uh, uh, circuits are somewhat simple, making it pleasant to model. Problem is that the hydraulics is a full of parameters that are often painful, painful to define. And that's the big problem in the hydraulics. So the math behind, not so involving, not so difficult, but practical use is a little difficult simply because of these parameters that need to be defined are not so easy. So how is my voice, by the way, because uh, you know, I, I recognize that somebody's calling me and is uh, coming to my headset. So maybe let me, I think that I will need to take my phone off. Okay, so it's, it's gone. All right, back to the picture that I like a lot. You know, remember the, the way we look in the world and machines in particular is that we are thinking that the machine is consisting of several different disciplines. Each of them are interacting with each other. Yes, sure, we have the mechanical components and mechanical structure in the in a machine and a hydraulic driven crane like the one that is shown here is a good example. So the mechanical structures are like the piler here, lift arm, swing arm, four bar mechanism and so on and so forth. So we learn how to model this. But now, very important to understand that the mechanical structure itself cannot be considered as a machine because we need to produce the forces like we learned earlier in this course to introduce motion. So we need forces. So how is we can do these forces? How is we can accomplish these forces? We have to have an actuators one kind and there are different opportunities for us. So we can have a hydraulic actuators, which is very common simply because the power density is uh, superior in the hydraulics, but they could be electric drives they can be pneumatics. They can be something a bit more exotic than that, like Piazzor actuators and so on and so forth. But anyway, so we need to create the forces. And when you understand that the forces and the mechanical systems are in direction, then it actually makes sense to model the mechanical system, not the mechanism, but the mechanical system. You also know that the control system makes a quite a bit of difference in terms of dynamic performance. That too needs to be involved. And uh, if we have a time, I will explain in this course and how is that that can be accomplished. User, yes, user can be accomplished or taken into account by using real time simulation, like we're gonna learn a little bit later. And their working environment really depends on the application you're looking at. And that's something we're not gonna take a look at in details in this course, but something that is good to keep in mind all the time. So. What happens after today's lecture, or let's say after 45 minutes, is that we're gonna take a focus from this guy here, and we're gonna start looking this guy, actuators. Make sense? All right. So it's almost like, remember this, uh, this uh, Newton's second law, which says that the inertia forces 
equal than externally applied forces. Now, where these externally applied forces are coming from? Now we're saying that they are pin forces, they are point forces, but yes, where are they coming from reality? They're coming from the actors. And that's what we're gonna take a look next. Okay, makes sense. Now, midterm exam. We have a lot of winners. Winners are the ones that were scoring five out of five, like the best you can think of. This is a this list of the winners. Names, I cannot show you that because of uh, university regulations, so it's a little bit boring way, but can we give a big hand to winners? Very nice, very nice. Scoring five out of five from the midterm exam is a superior accomplishment. This is something that is very, very big deal. So can you see your, I see that some of you can, cannot see your name and you think that you have scored five out of five or what's the confusing? No confusion. You see your name? I mean, the number? You no, know, but you scored five, of, five out of five. Anyways, you know if you score five out of five, five, out of five make sure you give a, give a little bit of credit to yourself because this is a great accomplishment. This course, like I promised, is a one of the, or not, not one of the, but, but the most difficult course you can find in your master level studies, the most. I'm not sure about that. There are, you know, other courses that are equally difficult, maybe even more difficult than this one. So I don't know about that, but quite theoretical, definitely quite theoretical. Okay, good thing. So that's about that, but it was just a midterm exam. Big picture is this, you know, you need to take a look at how is that you can complete the course and there are a total of three different items that you can collect points. Actually, four different items you can collect the points. Three, three like big ones. And the big ones are written exam, which you can do by midterm exams, like many of you already did that. But keep in mind that the weekly homework is equally important than midterm exams. So it's very important you keep on doing that. We're almost in the end of the weekly homework. So there is, a, if I remember correctly, three more assignments to go. And then uh, that's about it. So there is no more assignments. Three or four assignments to go and no more weekly assignments. Simulation work will be given to you, uh, if not next week, then week after that. You can start working with that. So it's gonna be a student specific assignment to you. So you will get the initial values that are depending on your student ID number. And based on that, you need to build a simulation model. You need to make an interpretation about the results, not just the building the models, but making sure you understand the behavior. And that's gonna be worth of 35% of the overall score. So that's a lot. And then bonus points are these in-class quizzes, so it's a maximum 10 points. And you see the, how the grading will connect, consisting of. So if you're scoring 75% from everything, you know, then it's gonna be great, it's gonna be five. And the minimum to pass the course is uh, 35%. Now, if you're struggling, and we see you're struggling, we see you're making an effort. We are willing to be uh, flexible in this regard to somehow to organize a special assignments to you or something that makes sure that you can pass the course. But here's what I learned. I don't know if, I'm, if this is a true statement or not, but I learned that uh, each of the uh, midterm participants were able to score one or more. So if you made an effort, you can pass the course. All right. And if we see that there is a great effort, if there is a good effort, yeah, we can help you. So we can even organize a oral exam, if nothing else. But not the oral exam, if you're scoring four out of uh, five and you want to upgrade that to be five out of five, that's not going to happen. This is something, by the way, that is a little bit related to career counseling. I don't know if I have a time to explain that to you, but some of the students, particularly international students, are taking grades way too seriously, way too seriously, because I heard many times that I'm gonna die because I score four out of five. My life gonna end. There's no hope. Everything goes down to toilet, nothing left. And I tried to explain that no one except your mom will take a look at these grades. I don't know, I don't know even if your mom will take a look at this. <laughs> Absolutely no one else cares about this. So you take this so seriously for the reason that I don't understand. 
So they might take a look if you are applying precision in industry. They might take, they definitely will take a look whether or not you're holding a master degree. That's important. If you were able to complete your studies, but what grades, what grades from this course, that doesn't matter so much. But there's an exception, of course, always an exception. So if you wanted to go in academic career in a certain specific discipline, the discipline is under my supervision, then we sure we're gonna take a look how you score it. But then it doesn't really matter if it is three, four, or five. Each of them are okay. Because in academic career, what matters the most is the same that matters the most in this course. Guess what that is? Correct. Attitude. <laughs> it's all about the attitude. How is measuring attitude? So we have the different wires and sensors. We put it in your head. So we're measuring your attitude. No, we don't have the measurements to measure your attitude, but this is what matters the most. Keep this in your mind. The attitude is what matters the most. All right, so that's the big story. So remember, because, you know, what I, why I'm showing this? This is simply because I see sometimes the case that the student, a student is scoring very high from the first midterm exam, five out of five, and developing up nose attitude, like, I'm so good, I, need, I, don't, I can stop working, I need to do nothing else anymore. And then it's just a very small piece of the story. You still need to keep on working. But the good news is this, that we already see the finishing line. Okay, there, some of you are warning that you have a comments questions regarding the midterm exam. I don't know if, how we're gonna do it. Should we discuss that after lecture or, or how? During the break, okay, during the break, during the break, sure. All right, here's what's gonna happen. Some exciting times ahead of us, some exciting topics ahead of us. So we're gonna move on to hydraulics and if everything goes as planned, I think that everything will go as planned. So I'm gonna spend three weeks to explain you hydraulics. Then comes something that is a fantastic subject matter, something that is gonna be a, a lot of fun for you. So we're gonna take a look at it artificial intelligence and mechanical engineering. So if, you know, we'll see uh, this lecture is not yet completed, but if everything goes like I think it will go, we will show you how to create models, even multi-body models using large language models. You know, large language models like ChatGPT is a one example about that. And uh, I'm the kind of the teacher that I'm hoping you to use this new technology as much as you can, including large language models. But that's just the one piece of uh, artificial intelligence. There are many, many others that are making a major impact to mechanical engineering as well. What are these other disciplines and how they can be used in autonomous machinery, you know, data-driven this and that, data-driven models, uh, new business models, and so on and so forth. The entire lecture number 11 will explain you that. So then, uh, Real-time simulation and games will be the lecture number 12. That's going to be something I feel that is a lot of fun too, because my understanding is that some of you might like games. Or you hate games. No one hates games. No one hates games. Okay, so, so, so that may be something that you like too. But my games are not uh, rally games or... I mean, that they, no, no, they are funny. They are funny things, but they are not war games. I don't know what, uh, but I don't know what kind of games you're playing. I don't know. Minecraft? <laughs> what? Not Minecraft. Oh. Call of Duty. Yeah, we don't discuss about Call of Duty, but something else. Something else. Okay. And then the recap. By the way, I just realized that when I made these slides that there may be a chance that I need to flip real-time simulation and artificial intelligence because maybe I need to be aware of, uh, aware, maybe I need to be out of my office uh, in a week, uh, lecture week 12. But we'll see, I'll get back to that later. Okay, one more thing. You know, we're gonna take this pleasant, smooth ride about hydraulics, but I really, I don't know why, but I really insist that we, there's a, one more discussion about multi-body system dynamics. Why? Because this is related to this concept of virtual work. And the concept of virtual work is something, like I say, is, is seemingly simple, but so difficult to use. I want to revisit the concept of 
virtual work. And I want to show you an alternative way to create the equation of motion, which will be based on substituting constraints inside of the equation of motion. Remember when we started everything from the math? So we say that we have a function, we have a constraint. And we wanted to minimize the function such the way that we are not violating against the constraints. And we learned that there are two different ways to make it happen. We can either substitute the constraints inside of the original function, which we're going to do today. So I'm going to show you how is that we can create the equation of motion by using this substitution technique. Or alternatively, we can add the constraints original equation by using Lagrange multipliers. Two alternatives. Something that is very important to understand that each of them will lead to same responses. Like I mentioned earlier, every now and then you hear this weird statement that this behavior is because of the Keynes dynamics. This behavior is because of the Lacrans dynamics. Dynamics is a dynamics. And the response need to be the same regardless of the selection of equation of motion. Keep this in your mind. So if somebody is coming and claiming that this is because the equation of motion is this and that form, that's nonsense. It needs to be based on the physics. Newton's second law, simple like that. OK, so we're going to take a look at this substitution technique, and then we're moving on to hydraulics. All right, remember this. This story was three weeks back, if I remember correctly. So I had this original function, the, one, the function q, this one here. OK, so here it comes. And then there is a constraint. So I have two variables in my function. They are y1 and y2. And then I have a constraint that it is uh, something that I need to take into account. And again, I need to find a minimum for this function such that I'm not whiling against the constraint. So I need to obey the constraint. Remember, we did this by using Lagrange multipliers. But before we did that, we made something that is you learn already in a, I don't know, high school. I think a high school, probably in a high school when you were looking at the minimizing of a function together with the constraints. All right. And that was something that we substituted the constraint inside of the original function. Now, what I did here, you know, these are my original functions. This one here, and this is my constraint. So what I'm doing here is that I'm solving y2 from my equation. And then I'm substituting that to that particular location of my equation. What is left when I do this substitution is y1 only, nothing but one variable. Now I have one equation, one variable. So what I can do then? So I can find the minimum by searching that by using a differential, a differentiating this with respect to the variable, the only variable that I have in the system. OK, the only variable that I have in the system is a y1. So when I differentiate the original, I mean, the function with respect to y1, it's going to give me this equation. And now when I'm setting this to be equal to 0, then I know that this is where the tangent becomes to be 0. This is where, the, where I can find the, what I'm looking for. All right? So when I'm setting that to be 0, that's going to be giving me y1 is equal 1 divided by 2. And then I redo it. I find it in one dimension. And now I look in this in another dimension. Again, the same procedure. So I'm solving y1 from my constraint. I substituting that to this part of the equation. And then I'm differentiating that with respect, excuse me, y, y2. I differentiated that with respect to y2. And I will keep my second variable, substitution technique. So this is the minimizing the number of equations. I couldn't get less equation than this to solve the problem. Remember what I did in the case of Lacrans multipliers? I added the number of unknowns and added the number of equations. This is the opposite of that. How this goes in multi-body system dynamics? Short explanation about that. OK. I know that you're like, oh my God, this is never, this, this story never ends. But it will. Only this story and then it, this is it. Like it or not? I guess not. But anyways, so it goes like this. Remember a while ago, 
we describe the virtual work defined made by externally applied forces, virtual work done by inertial forces. And we set these two set of virtual works to be equal. And we end up to have this kind of the equation. And we say that this equation in general case cannot be set to be equal to zero. Cannot. Because the virtual displacement here, which is this component here, is made such the way that I'm not respecting my constraints. I don't respect because I'm introducing the virtual displacement to all the possible directions. Think about this uh, crankshaft mechanism. So I'm taking my, let's say, my connection rod body, and I'm moving that to Y, I mean, RX direction, RY direction, and I'm rotating that without taking no care at all about my constraints. Definitely, I will violate my constraints if I do something like that. So I need to make a displacement in such a way that I'm making something that is kinematically admissible. Now, if this delta Q is explained in a way that I'm not violating against the constraints, then, and then only, I can set this equation to be equal to zero. Now, how can I do this displacement such that I don't violate against the constraints? Obviously, I need to do something like zoning this figure. You know, if I take a hold of the piston body, like shown here, and I move my, move my piston body to the left side, such that the constraints are accounted, this is what's going to happen. So obviously, kinematically admissible displacement need to be made in a way that I'm somehow using my constraint equations. If I'm able to do that, yeah, then I'm actually able to express this virtual displacement such the way that it is kinematically admissible virtual displacement. Okay, you're still with me? You're following what I'm explaining here? Okay, this is, like I say, this is why the concept of virtual work is so often misused. People think that no matter how you do this guy, you can always set this to be equal to zero, and you cannot. You need to make it in a way that constraints are accounted. How we can make this to happen? Okay, obviously, we need to start looking at the variables. So we need to start looking at the variables that are defined in the configuration of my system. This uh, crankshaft mechanism consists of three moving bodies. So I will have a total of nine generalized coordinates. All right, so uh, now obviously, when I look at the number of degrees of freedom, remember I have nine coordinates, but I have eight constraint equations. So I have one degrees of freedom in my system. Now, what if I'm going to select one generalized coordinates to be my degrees of freedom? Because degrees of freedom can be actuated any way I want. I just select one to be my representative of my degrees of freedom. And I'm moving that. And the rest I'm forcing to follow the constraints. This will be my way to accomplish kinematically admissible displacement. All right. So it goes like this. You first define the, what is the number of degrees of freedom. Once you know the number of degrees of freedom, then you know how many generalized coordinates you can select to be representing your degrees of freedom. And these representatives are called as independent coordinates. Those are the ones that can move based on the forces in both. Rest are called as a dependent coordinates, which are not capable to move as they want, but they will need, they need to be moving based on the constraints. You can do this selection. You can select independent, dependent coordinates pretty much as you want. There are mathematical limitations. We get back to that. But basically, you can select as you want. And then what matters is the numbers. So dependent coordinates need to be equal to the number of degrees of freedom. Dependent coordinates need to be equal to the number of constraint equations. How you do this division doesn't really matter so much. But you got the point. You got the point. <laughs> OK, I don't remember what I was explaining, but, but uh, 
Only thing that I remember was this, you got the point. But anyways, let me try to, re let me, because my memory is very strong, but it's short. But uh, so, uh, so uh, let me try to remember. Okay, I said this, that the number is what matters. So once you know your all the variables, that meaning all your generalized coordinates, that's your selection of all the coordinates. Once you know the degrees of freedom, then you can select the number of independent coordinates, this guy's here. That number must, must match with the number of degrees of freedom. So if I say that this guy has to be number-wise same that the number of degrees of freedom. So crankshaft mechanism, one degrees of freedom, meaning that one coordinate only will be in this category. Rest will be in a category called dependent coordinates. And this means that if I'm moving my independent coordinates, rest will follow based on the constraints. That's what it means. Was this what I mentioned earlier? So it's better explanation. Look at that. So, okay. So it's getting better and better. Okay, good. Now, if that's the case, what is a number of independent generalized coordinates? In this case, this is a crankshaft mechanism. So you need to compute the number of moving bodies. Then you know the number of all the generalized coordinates. Then you need to comp compute the number of constraints. Then you know number of constraints. And then you need to uh, compute the number of degrees of freedom. And that's exactly the number of independent coordinates. Generalized corners, independent generalized corners to be more specific. Options are one, uh, three, five, nine. Success rate, 100. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think it is 100, but it can be high. I think it can be 85, 80, 80, 80, 80. 90. It's going to be the first digit is nine, definitely. First, first digit is nine. I'm thinking that it is nine. Okay, so we'll see. We'll see that. Okay, and uh, I see that I'm uh, slow today. So the secretive is open. So uh, you guys are, are okay? Good? Okay. Okay, let me continue my story. So I'm going to soon ready to close uh, the substitution technique. Embedded. So I'm embedding my constraints inside of my original equation of motion. All right, then I do the same, this coordinate partitioning to my Jacobian matrix. You know, if I'm selecting my number of uh, dependent coordinates to be eight, like in the case of the, the previous mechanism, then the part of the Jacobian matrix associated to those coordinates I'm selecting to be a dependent part of my Jacobian matrix. Rest will be independent part of my Jacobian matrix. So it's going to be simply like, you know, if the Jacobian matrix looked like sets that I have here, certain number of rows, the rows are the ones that are corresponding my constraint equations. And then I have columns that are corresponding my, my generalized coordinates. I'm going to make a selection such that uh, the one that is here in a size will be selected to my dependent coordinates. So it's always skewer that I need to select. And once I do this selection, then actually I can find a relation between the independent coordinates and all the generalized coordinates in that particular configuration. It works like this. I do this uh, virtual displacement like it's shown here. And I'm assuming that I'm following my constraints so I can set this to be equal to zero. And then I'm simply solving here dependent part of my generalized coordinates. Once I do that, you know, then it shows like this. Dependent part of the generalized coordinates can be expressed in terms of independent generalized coordinates. And what makes it happen, or what makes it possible, is this coordinate partitioning that I'm using in my Jacobian matrix. Okay, you don't understand this, but that's okay, because we're going to practice this momentarily. And this needs to be, this dependent part needs to be inverted. That's why it needs to be skewer in dimension. You know that skewer is not necessary uh, enough to invert a matrix. 
actually this selection that I just mentioned that you can do the selection as you want, you cannot do as you want, but there is a mathematical tool that is called Gauss elimination with full pivoting or Gauss elimination column pivoting. This is a procedure that will do this selection for you automatically. So it's changing the order it's selecting which one is a, that you should select as an independent one and which ones are the ones that you should select as a dependent one. But we can make a, we can cut the corners here. We can say we, you can select, do the selection as you want. All right. All right. So we continue then. Now, once I have this information about dependent, independent, I can express my all the virtual displacement such the way that it's independent ones the ones that are representing my decrease of freedom. Look at this, this is beautiful. This is beautiful because you see this already? You see the same? You see the same that I do? Yes, you see that I'm able to express my... Correct, Correct. hawk, no hawk, no hawking. Okay, okay, no hawking, but, uh, but it's a big deal because, uh, you know, here, I have my virtual displacement of all the generalized corners, but using this relation, I can express it in a way that it is kinematically admissible. Yes. Okay. Then when I do that, you know, this can be now set to be equal to zero. Here it is. Here is my substitution technique. That's all you need to know. There's one more but, and it's quite serious but. And the but is that you know, I need to do the coordinate partitioning to accelerate the level two to get rid of this monster guy. This guy still consists of all the generalized coordinates, and I don't want that. I want to have only independent ones. I can make that happen too in accelerator level. And once I do that, then I will get equal number of decrease of, I mean, equal number of differential equations than the number of decrease of freedom. Remember, you know, in method based on Lagrange multipliers, the number of unknowns were generalized coordinates plus constraint equations. Now there are number of equations needed are generalized coordinates minus constraint equations. So you may say, okay, this is a superior technique because uh, it's less equation. Yes, this is in some cases, this can be superior, but uh, this is uh, not so easy because you need to do this coordinate selection based on uh, Gaussian elimination with the full pivoting every time step. And the coordinate updates is a little bit of CPU consuming step as well. Each of them have the advantages and disadvantages. But, okay, this is a little bit geographical discussion, but, you know, US teams in multi-body system dynamics, they prefer to use Lagrange multipliers because it's, a, it's straightforward, no thinking needed, it's, it's a beautiful method, whereas many of the Europeans would like to use the substitution technique, embedded technique. Okay, my educational background is from US, so that's why we prefer what? Correct, Lagrange multiplier. You can prefer whatever you want, doesn't make much of a difference because each of them will give you the same Final response. Okay. All right. So, should we take a look how we're doing in a soccer team wise? Let's take a look. It's just that I hate to do this because every time that I take this, I take this off. Yes, this will happen. This is a, so annoying. So annoying. I don't know why it is doing this for me. Hmm. Okay, not this one, but this one. Okay, what is the success rate? I, oh, okay, so we have bad news here. Bad news is this. No, no, we don't have a bad news because I'm checking the number of answers I got. So it's 70 answers. So it's very important you don't give up this course. You keep on following. Even though that you're thinking, now I know everything about multi-body dynamics and I know everything about, I figured out everything a while ago. I don't need to follow this course anymore. You do. You still need to follow this to make sure you're scoring high. Okay, so I was checking that I got less students than in our first period, but roughly saying, isn't it? Roughly saying, okay. 
success rate 100% looked like this. Okay, so it's not 100%. So it's all time low. All well, time low. Okay. So they, they what? Hangover. It's it's Tuesday. You guys don't you don't know that it's Tuesday already, or why? Exam week is for exams, not for drinking. <laughs> really? Yeah. But what you know, what about this? You close your final exam. This score is in a Sunday night, let's say at ten o'clock. So where do you do the drinking then? Because the Monday morning the lecture is getting started again. <laughs> Even today. Okay. A little bit disappointment, but let me re mention this again. Number or degrees of freedom is equal to the number of independent coordinates, which is equal to the number of unknowns. It used to be, remember, generalized coordinates plus constraint equation. Now it is minus, minus. Okay, minus. So now if you have a pendulum, what is the number of unknowns in the case of pendulum when you're using embedded technique. One. How can I know that? I know it because uh, in a pendulum, okay, let's see if I can do the drawings here. You see this? So in a pendulum, I have one moving body. So that's three generalized coordinates. And because of the revolute joint here, I have two constraint equations. So the decrease of freedom is one. Okay, so the number of unknowns if I divide the equation of motion using embedded technique is one. Clear. Okay, so let me move on to, let me do this. And okay, now I need to uh, uh, disconnect this and connect again. Like this. All right, very good. Very good. Okay, here's a summary. Embedded technique, so we are substituting the constraints. So we're simply looking the representative of decrease of freedom. And this representative you can select as you want. In commercial software, it's selected using a Gaussian elimination with a full pivot. But for us, it's enough to just to select something and just check if you are able to invert your dependent part of the Jacobian matrix. If yes, that's good, you can get to go. If no, you need to do another selection. In augmented technique, augmented formulation, we're looking at the reaction forces, and because of that, each of the bodies are con considered as a unknowns. So we don't make use of the constraint equations, but we kind of adding the constraint equation to my original equation. That's why the conceptually, they are completely different. But now you know the both. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, why not? So it's pretty useful information. All right, and the beauty is this. So you're using coordinate partitioning in a Jacobian matrix, and here's the solution to solve the whole thing. All right, so let me show the next example. And this is a, all right, so this is a summary. So everything was based on the virtual work. And when you do the virtual work, you can have this very important relation between the generalized coordinates and global coordinate. Now I'm using this another relation here, which is relating my generalized coordinates and independent generalized coordinates. Once I do all these substitution, then I can set this one here to be equal to zero. I'm able to find my equilibrium. This is in statics, because what I'm missing here is uh, inertia forces. This was just externally applied forces. But I could do the same for inertia forces, and that's how it works. Okay, let's make a simple example. Okay, a little bit more about that. But uh, simple example is this: there's a one moving body with this, which is constrained by using primitive joints. Now, by the way, what if I would ask, what is the number of independent generalized coordinates, number of unknowns when using embedded techniques? What would be the correct answer for the mechanism like this? One. One, One is a correct answer. One. One. 
No, he's I have two fingers up, so he's one. Okay, so he's one. One is a correct answer. All right, but anyway, so so let me show how can I find the static equilibrium by using the technique we just learned. All right. Here is a check copy of matrix that I'm not looking at the details anymore. I'm just taking this from the lecture notes. Uh, what was it? Five weeks back, six weeks back, five weeks back. And this is how it looked like. And I know that the number of degrees of freedom is one. So I need to select one coordinate to be independent. The rest will be something that following the motion of the independent coordinate. Now the obvious selection is a uh, angle theta. Why? Because, you know, if you look at this part of this particular section of the Jacobian matrix, this is identity matrix. So it's very simple to invert, very, very simple to invert, because you're inverting the identity matrix, it's identity matrix. So that's uh, no math needed. Okay, so it meaning that uh, I'm doing my selection such the way that this last column, which is representing my angle theta, I'm selecting to be independent one. Rest are the following, the motion of independent one. How it happens? I do this part of this skewer part of the Jacobian matrix. I inverted that, which is no inversion at all, because again, identity matrix. And when I do this um, math multiplication, my relation is this. So now if I take my angle theta here, and I move the angle theta, this is how Rx and Ry are following my motion. This is kind of giving me the, how is the kinematics of my structure, automatic, all right? So here's my relation between independent generalized coordinates and all the generalized coordinates. And then uh, I'm comparing my generalized external applied forces, one force only, which is gravity pointing downwards. So I'm seeing where the force is applying and differentiating that position with respect to my generalized coordinates. And this is how my generalized external applied force is reached. Okay, so then I'm combining my information such that, you know, here's my virtual work. And I'm expressing my virtual work by using generalized coordinates. And then one additional step, I'm expressing all the coordinates such that the constraints are accounted, automatically accounted. And when I do that, this is how I can find my static equilibrium. As a static equilibrium, you know, this is my generalized external applied forces. This was my, this part of my equation. When I do the math, this is how you find it. And the configuration is like this or like this. So we were able to do it. One equation only, nothing but the one equation because of one degree of freedom. I hear you. I hear you when you do this. <laughs> is what? So all the, that, that comes uh, natural. Okay, automatic. Okay, very good, very good. Yes, sir. This is just to demonstrate how you can find an equilibrium. Equilibrium. Are we gonna do this in a case of dynamics? This, this when I'm finally stopping my stuff about multi-body. It's about to time to stop it, right? You agree with that? Definitely. Okay. All right. Now, here it is. So this is embedded technique. So I have this very important step, which I'm expressing the virtual displacement by using representative of our degrees of freedom, independent generalized coordinates. Once I do that, this is always my equation of motion. And then I'm using something a bit painful in my last slides which is defining the acceleration by using independent accelerations only. All right, so make it happen. I need to take a look at this equation that I looked a little while ago. I differentiated my, um, my uh, acceleration multiplied by uh, Lacran Jacobian matrix. And when I do the coordinate partition, I know that, I know that I'm very fast here, but I just wanna highlight here because the math is quite a bit involving. So I'm dividing my coordinates in acceleration level that they are such that they, they are based on the dependent part and independent part. When I do that, 
you know, then I can find the relation that relates all my acceleration such the way that there is a dependent acceleration and independent acceleration using the material from my previous slide. I can express it by using matrix notations that are later denoted as a B and D. B is something that we were already familiar with. The D is completely new. When I use this information, this is how finally my equation of motion look like. And again, number of differential equations will be the equal to the number of unknowns. That's how it goes. All right, so ready to close the case. Here's a one more summary. It's an embedded technique, augmented formulation. We looked at this a little while ago. So let me just close this by looking at this last example. This is definitely the last of the last of the last. So I'm looking at this simple mechanism, which is kind of like a pendulum, except that there's a primitive joint here and here. Degrees of freedom is one. OK, so I'm creating the equation of motion for this simple mechanism. My in-class quiz is this. This example, the number of unknowns will be, or not will be, is, one, three, five, six. More than uh, last time the Sukadev success rate was 60, what was it, 60? 63. All time low. I think it was all time low, wasn't it? Yeah, never been that low. Are we going down or up? Are we going to get scoring something less than 60? 3% or more than 63%? More. More. Is it going all the way up to the nine, something that the first, first digit is, uh, is nine? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, we'll see that. We'll see that. Okay. <clears throat> so, I'm going to revisit the entire example momentarily, but let me show how is that I can create the equation of motion. Step number one, mass matrix. No difference regardless the method you use. You always need to have a mass matrix, and it's recommended to use a pre-calculated table to get the mass moment of inertia. We will get the diagonal representation of mass matrix because body reference coordinate system is located in the center of the mass. Quadratic velocity vector will be equal to zero because of that fact as well. All right, so I'm able to create my mass matrix. This is how it looked like. This is a mass of the body, mass of the body, mass moment of inertia with respect to coordinate located in the middle. All right. Step number two, generalized external applied forces. So this is something we learned in the example few minutes back, so we have a gravity force applying in the center of the mass, and this is where the body reference coordinate system is located as well. So uh, this is how it is. That's step number two. Quadratic velocity vector, we don't need to care about that because we have a diagonal mass matrix. And then comes the painful part. So we need to create this matrix B and D that are now based on the coordinate partitioning. Again, you need to do the selection. You need to select which one of the coordinates will be the independent one, and the rest will be dependent ones. Obvious choice, again, is that, okay, because uh, this identity matrix that is obviously in the beginning of my Jacobian, I'm selecting those guys to be my dependent ones. The remaining one will be independent. Yes, sir. It's uh, something you take a deep breath, collecting your strength, and then we're moving on to step number five. So, uh, is it needed? Desperately needed. Okay, so very good. So, uh, uh, good point, by the way. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, so we have our dependent part and independent part, and then I'm computing the components that I needed. 
OK, this was my B matrix, and the B matrix was something that I need to compute this CDI. OK, this is what I did a little while ago. And the D matrix is this big pain that I need to have this coordinate partitioning in acceleration level. Don't think about the math. Let symbolic math tool to do this for you. So don't take too much involved with the math. So you will get eventually the D matrix that is written like this. And finally, the equation of motion look like this. OK, I don't do the, the final math here, but I could do this by, with help of symbolic math tool. But you see that this is equation that is represented by with respect to one variable only. There's just one equation that is solving the response to me. OK. Embedded technique, substitution techniques, equations are based on coordinate partitioning. You need to participate your coordinates in two different categories, dependent and independent ones. And then equation of motion is not involving the reaction forces because they disappear. We don't have this prize or we don't have this something that we have to pay because of the constraints. We don't have this anymore, so it's, it disappeared. So that's another thing. So we have only very few number of differential equations. Augmented formulation, so we have very large number of equations of motion. They are relatively simple to solve, and uh, reaction forces are included. So those are the two different approaches. Now you know them both. Modeling tips, because uh, like I mentioned, this next week or week after that, you will get your simulation assignment. Make sure that when you're building your simulation assignment, you know, simulation is something that helps you to do the thinking. Helps you to do the thinking. So it's not replacing your brains. You still need to do the thinking. Remember, the simulation is a, is a tool to learn faster. Nothing but learn faster. All right? So that means that when you're building your model, you need to verify that frequently. And if you see that something is odd, that's where you need to stop. You need to explain this to yourself, or you need to find the modeling mistakes. Those are the two alternatives. Usually, this is where I very often see that people, when they see the odd behavior in the model, they're solving the problem by increasing the complexity. This is completely wrong way to go. If you don't understand, is really not going to help you to increase in the complexity, but other way around. You need to clear the case. You need to make sure that you understand everything you do. Make sure that you understand what is the number of degrees of freedom in your model. And make sure you understand each of the parameters you're using. You don't have that many difficult parameters except the ones that are related to hydraulics, but you need to understand what is that they representing. Otherwise, you're going wrong. And then never merge the rigid bodies by fixed joint. This is what we discussed very easy, very frequently. Analyze, visualize your model that you can, you can see how it behaves. Before dynamic analysis, try to find the static equilibrium, something we get back to a bit later. Think, think, think rather than do, do, do. These are my advices to you in a simulation assignments. And now it's about the hydraulics. So I kept my promise. I say, no, I didn't, because I said 45 minutes, and it was uh, two minutes more than that. A couple minutes more than that. OK, but you survived. You survived fine. All right, so we're going to move on to hydraulics. Uh, but before that, we're going to have a break. How much do you need? One hour? No, 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 not, not in a, that's not going to be possible. How, one minute. One more week. One more week. <laughs> Definitely not, because we are, yeah. OK, so uh, we're going to have a break. Five minutes is five minutes, OK? But before you go, before you go, let's take a look at this. Uh, OK, just a sec. And I will keep the introduction. There's a first uh, stuff uh, related to hydraulics somewhat short. And then we can go. Uh, but uh, first, I want to show you this. Number of unknowns is eighty-five. 80, 80, 
84%. So it's in, improving. But why is this five? Where the five is coming from? Ah, it's it because of the generalized coordinates plus constraint equations. Okay. Should we give a points to those ones that are voting five as well? Here's the very strong case. This is a really strong case. So we can act, so if we do this, then success rate is actually not 90%, but so the success rate is actually 96%. <laughs> That's what we're gonna do. Thank you very much. So uh, so one and five are correct answers. Good. Okay, and now is a break. Five minutes, five minutes. I'm gonna mute myself.
try to solve the exam questions with him first two digits. No. What is that? Uh, no. Uh, no. no. What about what was the good idea? Like, thank you. Like. <laughs> but but uh, because I heard that you can take a picture of the, the yeah, question. Yeah. And now. Yeah. 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 yeah, because in uh. one course, Theory, right? it, it can compute, for example, like the MATLAB code. It yeah. do this. No, it might. It but might it, be able it to do it. Like yeah. You never know. You should try it. You should try it. <laughs> you should try it. Yeah. 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 It's able to read that too. Yeah. The chat CPD can do quite a bit of things. You can try. Try. Yeah, why not? So I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna come to your apartment and make, you know, you like <laughs> open the door, freeze, and <laughs> sorry, my ID, my university ID here is, a, I'm coming to rest, you know, arrest you or something. But, but but you know that what they do in a because paper exam you can take it with you so you can always take it with you and what they do in a student union at the time that we use a lot of paper exam they have her files about paper exam so once you once you finish the paper exam you put it in a files now the new students they will first go and check it how are the exams so very painful for professors very very painful yeah old exams Yeah, take a look at that. Yeah. Take a look. Uh, yeah. 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 I know. I know. You know. This was already almost uh, okay. We we guys need we need to start. Uh, but I'm going to explain something about this when once we get started. You know. Uh, um, So, yeah, so the story that I wanted to tell. So let me see how is that, how is the streaming, by the way. Is it okay? I think it is okay. I think it is okay. Very good, very good. So uh, this was almost 20 years back. I worked a little while in University of Seville, in Spain. And in Spain, they have this culture that is very different than in uh, Nordic countries. Uh, so. Uh, one morning I came to my office and uh, the, the, my supervisor's office was next to mine. So the, the professor that was supervising me. And uh, one morning I came to my office and there was a lot of students, a big crowd, a lot of people there. And I was like, what is this day? They said that this is a day that you can come to see your exams. You can try to complain about the cravings. And they, each of them are doing it. So, And I, I heard when the, the door was opening, you know, the student came into the, the office, the professor office, then they started to discuss, and then they started to yelling, and then they're yelling each other like really big time, and then finally the door was slammed back to close again. And I was asking, like, is this a usual way? And he said, yes, this is a usual way. Unusual way is this, that happened to him once, that the student came with the mom and complained about the grading, and the mom was yelling to professor. So now, if you wanted to complain, take your mom with you. So uh, then <laughs> that could be something to consider. Think about that. <laughs> OK, very good. Hey, uh, let me get started with the hydraulics. So this is a picture we looked in the very beginning. And these are just the example of where the hydraulics is used. So these are very common, common cases in mobile machinery. Hydraulics is very often used simply because of the power density. Power density means that 
you know, physical dimensions, certain size of the physical dimensions are capable to produce a lot of forces. No other actuators are capable to do the same than hydraulics. Hydraulics can produce a lot of forces with a minor, I mean, reasonable dimensions. This is something that is a great benefit of hydraulics. Also, the hydraulic actuators, cylinders or motors are lightweight, lighter than other means of actuators. So that's another big benefit of the hydraulics. One more big benefit of the hydraulics is that uh, it is pretty st standard technique. So it doesn't need much of innovation to use it. There's a lot of components available. So it's simple to use. So it's straightforward to use. But when you look at the recent developments in the hydraulics, you don't see that much of a development. They're still based on the pump. The pump is the one that is producing energy to the hydraulic circuit. And then, you know, then there's a different kind of control elements like direction valves, pressure relief valve, and so on and so forth. But you're guiding your pressures to your actuators, which is a hydraulic cylinder or the motor. And then you use the, the energy in your actuators and then take your energy back to the tank. This is a principle that is still much in the use. And there is not much great advantages on that regard. Of course, there is a pressure compensated, I mean, uh, load sensing pumps, like the pumps that are capable to sense whether or not the energy is needed in a system. This is uh, something that helps a little bit in uh, energy consumption, but not much other than that. Something that is uh, quite big, but still more like not yet so much in the use is called digital hydraulics. Something that I'm going to explain later in my class. What is a digital hydraulics? And there's a big promise related to digital hydraulics and that the way that it may be able to consume less energy than conventional hydraulics. I don't know if you guys heard about it, the digital hydraulics already. You haven't. Okay, so you came from Tampere or where? Not Tampere. Egypt. Egypt. Okay, so, but the Egypt and uh, that was a digital hydraulics in there. Because I heard, I, okay, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought that the, the capital of digital hydraulics is in Tampere, Finland. I'm wrong about that? Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah I, of course, I don't follow the details of the hydraulics that carefully, so I don't know. But I know that in uh, Tampere University, they do quite a bit of studies related to digital hydraulics. And there are companies too. What is the concept? What is the deal with the digital hydraulics? That I will explain to you. But, but that seems to be finally something that seems to, seems to be a good relief in terms of energy consumption. Because in a conventional hydraulics, it goes even in a he heavy machinery, a mobile machinery, it goes in such the way that there's a diesel engine that have the constant RBM, the constant uh, velocity in the engine. So it's always having the same RPM. This is rigidly connected to pump, and the pump won't keep on producing the energy the system needed or not. But this is not very good because you need, you're need you wasting a lot of energy when you do so. Of course, this different kind of this pump technology helps you a little bit, but still you're losing quite a bit of energy. And this is the whole concept. And particularly what you can, or what is difficult to do with the hydraulics is that if you like lift something with the hydraulics, when you lower it down, it's so hard to harvest energy using hydraulics because they go with the different channels back to the tank. And now if you know, don't know what I'm explaining about tanks and pumps, fine. We're all gonna take a look at these later, so it's not a big deal, but yes, sir. Is there anything to relate to To Pascal's. So Pascal's law, so uh, of fluids. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're gonna touch, we're not gonna touch that. We're not gonna touch that. We need to take a little bit of shortcuts when we're looking at the, the fluid dynamics here. So important things about the hydraulic modeling is that we are not gonna follow the CFD or anything of any of those advanced technologies because we need to have the model that is capable to be solved in reasonable amount of time. And we need to use the entire hydraulic circuit because we need to know the relation between the pump and the hydraulic cylinder. And we need to be able to solve that often in real time. 
if not in real time, let's say in a reasonable time length. And that's, uh, that's why we're cutting the corners quite a bit. But we'll see, we'll see how you're gonna like this. Okay, now uh, one more kind of like a pleasant thing that I, we realized recently related to hydraulics is that it's quite flexible, more flexible than electric drives. And we heard complaints that because there's a big trend that the electric drives are taking over the hydraulics, even in the heavy machinery and mobile machinery. We heard complaints that so it's less pleasant to use actuators that are electric, electrical actuators because they have no flexibility. They are really rigid. So when you want to like turn your capping using the electric uh, devices like, like this, your face will still look in this direction, but the rest of the body will be this direction. Now that's going to be unpleasant to operate like this. Hydraulics will be smoother because it's more flexible. I think I'm, that comes from the natural feature of the fluid being flexible because fluid is flexible. This is something that we need to take into account when we're modeling hydraulics. All right, so here are the few examples. This is a harvester crane, so a typical example in the heavy machinery. This is an industrial application, which is a deflex and compensated rolls. Use it in a paper making machines, paper machines. Is a um, device that, uh, I heard by the way, that this is a favorite example of Professor Andrews. So whatever he's explaining something is always related to deflection compensated growth. Am I right about this or you don't know? You haven't been in his lectures ever, so hard to tell. Okay, all right, so this is a device that um, like the title says is compensating the gravity, deflection. So it works like such that there is a shaft like this. And this is a, let, let's say that this is like simply supported beam like this. And now, around this shaft, there's a shell. I don't know how well you can understand my, my drawings, but there's like a shaft that is standing still. So it's not rotating at all. You can even put this in a, a touch to crown if you want, because no rotation whatsoever. And then there's a shell that is doing all the rotation. Now, connection between the shaft and the shell is made by hydraulic loading shoes. And these uh, hydraulic shoes are like tonal bearings. Well, a little bit like tonal bearings, with the exception that you can increase the pressure inside of the bearings. When you have this like, kind of like a loading components here, like this, and there are other side up here as well. You can pressurize these loading components that are working as a bearings, like the tonal bearings, but also as a loading component, then you can have a different kind of the deformation for this shell that compensates your gravity. And sometimes in a paper making process, you need to press one area harder than others, and that you can make it happen by using this kind of the rolls. Okay, so I've been uh, today a little bit uh, like too flexible telling stories about the Spain and other stuff. I'm still gonna share something that is off topic. You know, uh, I too have a history in uh, industry. So right when I got my doctor degree, I went and worked with a company called Walmet. That is, a Wal that is a company making paper machines. And my specialty was this kind of the rolls, the flex and compensated rolls. Actually, the only thing that I did there, just the, this kind of the rolls. Because the paper making process is all about the different rolls. Okay, and then there's a pilot drive which is the entire heavy machinery. And it works like this. Let me see if this uh, animation is okay. Ah, uh, this comes with the... This shows a little bit like, this is a typical hydraulic circuit. Uh, <clears throat> now, modeling of hydraulics is something that is like modeling of uh, multi-body system dynamics. They're usually a user interface to create the most, not equation of motion, but equations needed to describe the hydraulics. So it's typically that you have a symbol of uh, cylinder, symbol of pump, symbol of different kind of components. You're placing those to the, your screen, you connect them like you would connect them by using hoses or pipelines. And once you connect them, then the equations needed are created automatically. And uh, we don't do that. 
we do that partly, but we could also show you what is an equation behind, how this kind of the modeling works. What are those equations that are representing pressures at, as a function of time, how they work, how is an equation that are representing direction valves and so on and so forth. So that's what I'm going to explain you. Then, once you're using this kind of commercial software, it's going to be all quite easy you to understand what's the mechanism behind, what's under the hood. So that's what I'm planning to do in this course. Okay, so now just as shortly, we get started by modeling of hydraulics by looking at the, the properties of fluid. This is something that is uh, like basics, what you need to know. And once we know the properties of fluids, then we're going to move on something that is uh, very important, and that's something that is called land fluid theory. Land fluid theory is the one that tells you how is it you can compute the pressures as a function of time, pressures also as a function of flow rate, and uh, pressures also as a change of the volume and so on and so forth. So that's going to be like the, really the core equation we need to know. But before we are able to do so, we need to take a look at the fluid properties. And there are two properties that are important. And one of them is not very important. But two only that are important in a modeling perspective. And there is a, the one that is important is a bulk modulus that is describing the flexibility of the fluid. Another one is a viscosity. And viscosity, less important because the viscosity comes into play in a certain kind of the flow types only. And this flow type is a laminar flow. Laminar flow is not very common in a heavy machinery, simply because the laminar flow takes a place whenever the pressure difference is small. Usually, is high. And that's why typical form of the flow is a turbulent flow. But anyways, we get back to each of these details. So if you don't understand the flow types or anything I just mentioned, fine, because we get back to each of the items slowly but steadily. Okay. But the properties of fluids, that's where we're going to get started. Now, like I mentioned, two important properties, which is our viscosity and the bulk models. Bulk models is representing flexibility. So it's like elastic models you use in a structural strength analysis. Like, what is a material property? And uh, this is something that we will get started. And then we're going to take a look at the, this viscosity, which is more like... Um, like I say, important in a certain cases only. Only when you have a laminar flow. But like you know that, like example, I'm thinking where you can find the laminar flow is in this compensated, this deflection compensated rolls. Because these loading shoes that I just explained in my previous slide, in those loading shoes, you actually have a, a laminar flow. So this is a, one of the few examples that the laminar flow plays a very important role. And for that reason, the viscosity is very important as well. Hmm. I don't know what to do here. Should I get started with this or should I just simply close uh, today's lecture and get back to this? Because the story for each of these items is a little bit lengthy. I might not be able to complete them. So, uh, so what was that? Close now. Who is voting? Who is, who is, okay, would you like to challenge me in a gym or? Sure. sure. Very good, so I accept the challenge. <laughs> okay, who is voting leaving? Seriously, guys? Okay, so, uh, <laughs> okay, so let me take a look. Okay, we're gonna take a look at the short look about the bulk modelers. I don't think we're going to complete the case, but short look. Then you can go and your, do your practice. Very good. All right. So bulk modulus is something uh, that, like I mentioned, describes the flexibility of fluid. And now you might hear these stories that the fluid is not flexible. This is nonsense. Because, uh, you know, just to give you an example, like the fluid, water, oil is uh, flexible. Is that, you know, here when I'm speaking to you, what happens is that, there are waves that are traveling from my mouth to your hearing system. And you hear me? I don't know if you understand me, but you hear me, right? Meaning that because this, the, what is between you and me is air, 
So the waves are traveling fine in this air. They're traveling fine. We don't speak about understanding, but just traveling. All right? What if we're going to fill this womb by water? And I would speak to you. Then this will be the lecture that you hear me right now. It will be like, like this. Not much of a difference. Because you will still hear me, but not understanding me. But you don't understand my words anymore. But this is an example. Like if we, I was speaking in the water, you would hear me. So the waves are traveling in the water too. So that's just an example that, yes, water, like oil, is flexible. It's not as flexible as oil, as here. You can see the difference clearly when you compare the pneumatic actuators and hydraulic actuators. The difference is 1,500 times more rigid than air. More, sometimes even more, but it's a significant difference. And that's why the pneumatic actuators are they're very flexible. You know that. You can take a bicycle pump, you can close one end of the bicycle pump, you can still move the piston. Not much, but you can still move it. If you put, put, put oil on top of it, only I can do it, because, yeah. yes, correct. <laughs> you cannot. Maybe you can. No, I don't, I don't know. But anyways, so it, it, the, the difference in terms of flexibility is very significant. Okay, bulk modulus is defining this flexibility. To understand that, we need to make an experiment. And in this experiment, we have a rigid container, which you don't find in real life. But let's make an assumption that we have a rigid container. This one here. This is a unit size container. On top of the container, I have a lid. Lid here. And container is filled with uh, oil here. So what I'm going to do then is that I'm going to take a force. I'm going to compress this lid inside of my fluid. And what will happen as a consequence of that is that the pressure here will increase. You agree with that? Because I'm compressing my fluid. And the fluid size will this decrease. So it's getting smaller. And the bulk model is, is all about this relation. How is the relation between the increase in the pressure and decreasing the volume size? OK. So the bulk modulus is simply this relation. And because the volume size is getting smaller, that's why the minus sign in my relation. You know, this was in a unit size container. But if you would like to generalize this to other sizes of the containers, you need to take a container size into account. And you do that by multiplying or dividing this all by volume size. And when you do this math, this is the definition of bulk models. Like I said, that the hydraulic modeling is a full of parameters that are simplifications from reality. This is a good example, because uh, bulk modulus in reality is a function of number of items, including pressure, temperature, and so on and so forth. But in the modeling, we're typically assuming the bulk modulus to be constant. So we don't care that it's a function little bit of function this and that, because we need to make our life to be reasonable. And the reasonable is simply that we make an assumption. You know that what I have here is a little bit unclear picture, but this is a, so the bulk modulus as a function of temperature. And you see that, you know, then there is a different pressures. You see that this is a quite significant effect. And we don't care. We don't care about the pressure. We don't care about the Temperature, we're simply assuming that the bulk modulus is assumed to be 1,500 megapascal. That's the value we're going to use later in our modeling work. If you want to lower it, fine. But this is like a good guess as a beginning of your modeling work. Because the flexibility comes from the superimposed effect of fluid and the flexibility of containers. Like I said, you know, in my experiment, I have here rigid container. But we don't have this kind of rigid containers in a real life. Containers will always deform, sometimes more than others. Like if you have a rubber hoses, even, the, even though that there may be steel net, they still deform. And that flexibility that comes from the components can be more significant than the flexibility of fluid itself. 
how we're going to take this other flexibilities into account that I will get back to you. Guess what? Next week. Next stop, Tim. Tim will be next. Okay, guys. See you next week. And uh, what else? That's about it. Okay, let me close the streaming. And uh, then we're ready to bike back home.